fully understood what it said, and he fully understood how the people in Hawaii, the judges, couldn't read and write, and were just trying to run a bullshit scam against the Supreme Court, and the, the Hawaiian judges didn't know that they were prepared, waiting for them to walk into a trap, and they got thrown out of the Supreme Court with a real bad embarrassment. And this was all published in the newspapers. That was back uh, 26th of uh, February, 2009. So then to use any flag, if you establish it yourself in quantum language, it, it has standing. Right, we have a lot of yes. people that have, here in Australia, have copyrighted the flag of Australia already. Hmm. They actually went down and they sat down and I checked their, their, their declaration, I mean their, their claim for the flag, its dimensions, mm -hmm. and in every single detail, mm, well. that, that the sentence structure was of correct, the and they filed the, a claim for it. Mm. As of the understanding, if, the, if the, the, um, the flag isn't sort of recognized, it's um, a pirate flag. <coughs> well, you have different shapes. You have a three by four flag, you have a five by seven flag, you have a one by two flag. The three by four flag is your boat flag. The three by five flag is your military base flag. So one by two flag is a constitutional flag. And then you have different colors. You can change the color of the blue field. You can change the different shades of red. And you won't even know you're in a different, a different uh, flag. There, there's another thing, so as I get this off here, I'll show you some stuff about flags. Before you wipe the bottom line, you have the word flags as a dangling participle verb. Correct. What is the um, infinitive of the verb flag or flags? I don't understand your question. <laughs> well, if that's a verb, then what is it in its pure state as an infinitive? It should be, it should be using a prepositional phrase, by the flags. Well, if it's by the flags, then uh, that would be a noun, wouldn't it? It would be a fact, correct. Well, you say that's a dangling participle verb. What would make it a verb? Two is an adverb. An adverb goes modifies. Before. Modification is a change. A change is a motion. A motion is an action. An action is a verb. So you're saying just because it has the word two in front of it, that automatically makes the next word after it a verb, even Correct. though it's an if that's not normally a verb, it's a dangling participle verb. Because you're ending a sentence in a verb. You can't end sentences in verbs. Right. So and, what and meaning have, does that have in a sentence now? What, what? What meaning does that have? What's the real Nothing. meaning? That's just it. The Queen is saying, we don't recognize the flags of Australia. We don't recognize anything. We never had a contract to recognize. We don't have lodial title to Australia. We killed the origines and we stole their land. We built our buildings and our roads on top of it. And we haven't paid docking fees to put the road on the, in Australia. They owe the origines 173 years of back rent to dock their vessels on the land. That's about a $40 trillion paycheck for the origines. You think this was knowingly done? Yes, it was a, I can prove it. That's we did the same thing in, in Hawaii and the same thing in New Zealand. See, the unique, unique thing about Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, the, the Philippines, uh, the, all these small places where Cook showed up and then the English showed up afterwards, the English, it might have been an English ship, but it was controlled by the post office. This is all about the post office, folks, from 1800, all around the world, all these sailing trips that took place. And these declarations that showed up, it was always the post office. What's the first thing that happens? One, the ship shows, the, the post office shows, uh, rather the uh, ship shows up, and it's always a military vessel. All military captains on a vessel are masons and postmasters. And they take their orders from the, from the Masonic order in Bern, Switzerland, and the, and the Vatican, and uh, the Central Masonic Lodge in London. I don't care what government you're working with, it's all controlled by the Central Post Office. Then as, the, as a mason, they use the philosophies to control people and they initiate the kings and the queens of those uh, jurisdictions that they, they go into. They tell them they will give them anything they want and teach them all these philosophies to manage people and be successful. But when they join the masons, they have to give up and surrender their king and queen 
titles and do what the Masons tell them. The Masons will then compensate them and give them the royalty and all of the fluff that makes them look par all powerful. Because the other people that control the banks, which is the money, control the shipping, the commerce, the import, the export, that do the engineers, that bring in uh, educated people who have engineering technology. You put all these things together, every one of them are Masons. They keep, that's where the secret society issue comes in. They all work together to honor the, honor the head Mason, who is the king or the queen, but that's the puppet. Hmm. He gets all the flack. He gets all the honor that comes with the flack, while the postmaster, who is the postmaster general, runs everything, which is the port authorities, the money, and the transportation. Everybody wants to move. Everybody wants a freedom of movement. Nobody wants to sit in one place. You get bored. Boredom is a real bad, yeah, real bad pill to swallow. So the, Mesa, so, so the postmaster is going to make travel, build nice roads, and get the, the population uh, establish voting, and then put all these toys out there that you're going to vote on because you like your freedoms. You like your running water and your, your shower and your 200 channel TV and all these things at the expense of the people who own the land. But then the people who own the land, uh, if they were stubborn enough to fight them, they all died of some natural cause <laughs> prematurely. And then the rest of the, the people that can't fight the technology. Uh, you watched the news last night, the Falkland Islands. They just discovered they have 60 billion barrels of oil off the off Falkland Islands that the British are going to drill. The Argentine government is up in uproar because they claim that the Falkland Islands belongs to them, and they, but they don't have the technology or the money to go to a war, another war, with Britain. Because Britain's got nukes and they got missiles and they got enough toys to do a lot of damage to Argentina. You mean they need a uh, plenty potential judge to give him a hand? I could go down there, yes, and with a contract, I could say, "This is illegal, boys and girls. Show us your contract. You're trespassing. This is an international violation." But England's a small island, and they need. You know, they, they, England's pulling this, we got squatters rights because we got bigger guns and bigger clubs. That don't make it right. <laughs> but that's always been the case. That's what they did here in Australia. That's what they did in New Zealand. Okay, back to syntax. On the word to, uh, you've got 1.9. Does that mean it's a uh, future, future tense, tense of word. the adverb? It's not only it's an adverb, but it's a future tense word, which makes the flag to be a future tense verb. So they're not, only, they're not only dishonoring the fact that it's a fact, they're taking the fact and they're changing it into something it isn't, and then they're moving it off into the future so there's no now time jurisdiction to say, we did a now time violation. That's why all the twos come in. The United States Constitution bill has a Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights says you have the right to travel, the right to write, the right to read, the right to propagate. You have all these freedoms, why? In two? Every single one of them starts with two, which means it's all in the future. We have no now time rights. And the minute I said that and I published that all over the place, the United States government goes ahead and they drop the World Trade Center and say, all your rights are gone, folks. You got to go through security and everything is corporate. You want to walk into this building? You don't own it. You're going to be a trespassing individual. You need a passport. You know, Russell and I went to Europe. Russell mailed himself. He put a postage stamp and a flag on his chest and he mailed himself to Europe. Went down to the post office, sent his body registered mail, put a registered mail sticker on him, signed his name across it, and he mailed himself to Paris. First time in the history, since uh, in a hundred years that somebody transported himself a live body between point A and point B of a foreign government and got away with it. And the reason he got away with it, and, and this is, this, <laughs> This is really weird. As the 747 landed in Paris, all of the immigration and custom officers went on strike. So they had six supervisors to handle 4,000 immigrants coming through the gates. <laughs> we were backed up for a half a mile. I mean, this is really a, 
and they just opened the gates and they let everybody walk through, <laughs> including Russell. With his, I, they just said, hold up your passport, he's walked through. And as I, Russell was with me, and uh, the guy goes, wait a minute, where's his passport? I says, he's a postmaster and he's mailed himself to Paris. I'm a postmaster and I'm, I'm, I'm in charge of, the, uh, of, the, of my cargo and I've signed my name across his, his uh, registered mail sticker. All right, you can go. <laughs> How did he get? And that to? got that got back to uh, the United States Postal Service and the State Department that Russell had mailed himself. Every judge in America was notified about this. It was it was quite the route. How did he get through from America to get on the plane? Oh, the then when we came back, we, we went down to the Vatican. We established our key master's position with the Vatican. Well, the head of the Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris is the great great grandson of Joan of Arc. <laughs> who was a key master with the Vatican. What are the odds of that? Mm. So we're there, and we've got to run a DC-10, 300 passenger, and we're all getting ready to take off. And here's Russell with a ticket, and he's mailing himself back to the United States. Well, the, the central of Bern, Switzerland, because we were just there and met with the United States Postal Inspector for the whole, whole European continent, and we spent an hour and a half with him, so he vouched for, for Russell's knowledge as a postmaster. But then the immigration and customs officers would not allow Russell to board the plane. He said he didn't have a passport. Well, we had filled out the necessary paperwork to mail him back to the United States. And I was the postmaster transporting my cargo, who was a fellow postmaster. And this wasn't, the guy wasn't buying it. So uh, he had to call up the supervisor at 2 o'clock in the morning to come down to the airport. And when he found out that we were both key masters with the Vatican and he was a key master, we had a really nice conversation. And he walked us through as, as, as diplomats with diplomatic immunity and didn't require passports because of our, our status. They called Rome. The Vatican vouched, or Cardinal Sedano vouched for us. So did the uh, State Department in Washington which was uh, Postal Inspector Seuss, and Potter was the postmaster to vouch for us. So we had enough muscle from four different governments vouch for Russell and I that we got on the plane and flew back to uh, Philadelphia. So this is one of those, don't try this at home, boys. These are, right, these are, <laughs> the, the, these are, um, <laughs> th this, was, this was something that got through the cracks. Everything that Russell and I have done for 10 years has been the first time it's ever been done in history because it was done through syntax. And so they slammed the door on anybody else ever trying to do anything that we were doing, from getting a post, postmaster general position to being muster master at a Pentagon to key master with the Vatican to uh, postmaster of the uh, Interpol. Bern, Switzerland, the uh, Universal Postal Union and Quantum, where they were in fiction. I mean, we captured, we captured Zurich, uh, the World Court, Interpol, uh, the Vatican, Washington, D.C., the Pentagon. I mean, we, we went around and we, we knocked all these things down, one, one after another. They couldn't cat, keep up with us. They, had, they were spending thousands and thousands of dollars trying to keep up with the airfares of us. Captured Vatican? Can you elaborate? Sure. When we wrote a syntax quantumized uh, international bank treaty with the Vatican, it was the first time they ever saw syntax. All their bank treaties worldwide since, since 79 AD were written in adverb verb and had no standing. Now that they've got a syntax quantumized bank treaty, it automatically vacated their entire position globally. And there's been nothing but trouble ever since that. So they, we still maintain our key master's positions and our postmaster's positions with the Vatican, and we do correspondence. Okay, we'll talk about that later. I want to go back to the syntax. <laughs> um, the word to, you said that's always in the uh, um, future tense? Well, they will use it as an adverb in future tense. So is there any time in Australia we use the word to in any, um, in future past and present? And most of the time, it's used in the present. You yeah. only think it is. It's not. The rest of the sentence, all the different words that are here, are going to articulate 
why the value of that word is what it is. Now, the person that wrote this, you saw that there was a pattern. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, three, four. And those patterns of the queen don't change. I can look at any document I want. Queen Elizabeth has written. It's either written in one, two, or one, three, four patterns. Right. The reason I'm asking this, because we use the word two so much, and you said it is the most in, uh, bastardized word in the English language, um, that, that means we're going to be offending uh, our new knowledge of the syntax by being caught very easily using the word two. No, two way. is not found in my book. You've got 107 pages. The word two doesn't appear anywhere in my book. It doesn't have to be there for us to use it. <laughs> the point is, the point is your, your Freudian conditioning to use this word is only a, a conditioning <clears throat> because you've been doing it so much for so long, you're not qualified to do nothing. And that's exactly what happens when you use two. You create nothing. Right. So teach us how not to use it. Read the book. By the time you get done reading my book, you're going to see so many prepositional phrases and patterns and associations that your mind will automatically shift gears. Because when you read an adverb verb, you're going, this is wrong. I can do this. Every time you pick up a newspaper, the only thing you're going to be doing is syntaxing. If you taught me how to do it, I'd be able to read your book. <laughs> <laughs> if you read, okay, people always read to yourself, right? You don't speak out loud. When you read to yourself, you're only your eye and your brain are registering. You have five senses. When you read out loud, you're speaking. So the mechanical part of your brain has to generate your speaking capacity. You have to be able to see. You hear what you're saying. You're holding, a, you're holding something in, in your hand, the mechanics of your eye moving back and forth. You've got all five of your senses working with you when you read out loud to yourself because you hear what it says. 90% of all the things you learn in life are from hearing what you hear on TV, on the radio, somebody else talking to you and teaching you things. That is your major connection to your brain, to your memory cells, is the, what you hear. So if you read my book out loud to yourself, all of a sudden, like, it's going to start registering it. You get into a court scenario, you're talking to a judge. You're in an oral conversation. He's talking to you in an oral conversation. But if you're reading and only the cells of reading are registering, your hearing part of your brain is uneducated to hear or to speak, to reproduce those sounds of what syntax sounds like. And so you, you're handicapping your own self. And, and besides, when you get in front of a judge, you're going to be nervous because you don't want to go to jail. That's always the, the threat and the intimidation scenario. But if you read and you read out loud to yourself, You've got all these different senses working together. So if one gets nervous, you've got your other backups, which are going to kick in and protect you. And it will calm you down. You'll be able to carry on a conversation intelligent. Not intelligently. Because you always want to put that L-Y, which makes all words that end in L-Y, are adverbs. Even the word family, only. Those are two words that are used all the time, but they end in L-Y. It's the L-Y words that kill you. And usually L-Y words, when you end a sentence, you're talking and you're ending that sentence with an L-Y word adverb. And so therefore, you've got a dangling participle. It should be a verb, but you've got a dangling participle adverb. Can you start a sentence with a pronoun? No. Only with a preposition. A pronoun says nothing. Just like, what is your name? But we start. That's large a pronoun. Part of our I'm calling you. Sentences. We pronounce and adjectives. You're trying to grab that fuzzy little world of adverb verb fiction. You're brainwashed. That's why you're trying to make a brain, uh, an argument against syntax, while because you're trying to use nothings. There, an adverb is a modifier. An adjective is a coloring modifier. A pronoun is a nothing. It means no, no, no. You don't have a contract for a pronoun. How can you make communications if you don't have a contract? So what happens if you start the sentence with a pronoun, like you and I and us and we? They're not always pronouns. I saw. I can be, in, in this case, I saw. It's adverb, verb. Or I am. 
I is an adverb making am a verb. Or I can be the pronoun and am is the adverb because it connects to it in front. Both of them are wrong. So what you're saying is that if you use a, a pronoun, a personal pronoun at the beginning, then it changes to an adverb if it's followed by a verb. No. Uh, in other words, if you're saying pen is, pen is a pronoun, is is an adverb. Mm -hmm. Is pen would be an adverb verb. Easy Both become. ways is wrong, you don't have a fact. You don't have a sentence, you don't have a prepositional phrase, you don't have a verb of thinking. And if you got a verb thinking, where's the fact that you're going to be thinking about? You got to have 13 words to make a legal sentence. That's the smallest sentence you can possibly write, is 13 words. Anything less than that, you're just blowing smoke. So can you give us a running description of how a pronoun becomes uh, an adverb? When you like I said yesterday, if you ask me for a pen, I'll, I'll hold up a pen. If you ask me for a penny in Mori, I'm going to hold up a coin. But in Mori language, it means pen. Did you hear what I said, what I said, what I meant, what I said, what I meant, what I said? We got to have a communication. There's 5,000 languages out there. You're only thinking in one language, English. And English, E-N-G, is actually a D. In 1750, the English changed the D to a G because it was English, end of contracts. Somebody finally figured that out. So they changed it to a G so people wouldn't look for the word end, which means no. England was the end of the world, of Europe. You fell off it. Well, ever since Columbus in 1500 or 1492, they know that there was something else out there, and then people started exploring the world. All of the rules that you're talking about with syntax now and how words change and adjectives, are they all in the book like from, from someone that's a beginner? Like styles, that like, <laughs> it's in the styles manuals of all 250 countries. But where do we learn that if, if someone's just beginning to try and grasp an understanding of that, is your book? My book explains it all, yes. My yeah. book explains it over and over and over again. To the point it becomes double speak. You can get on my internet site and look at it too. Yeah, I had a look there, at the internet site. Couldn't read. <laughs> <laughs> That's only because you haven't you haven't come to the seminar and, and had and been exposed to all the things, the conversation. Fair enough. So. Think we don't need paper, we need, we need a washcloth or something, because paper doesn't do a good job. We need... See if, see if the management's got a rag or like we had here yesterday. Or get some white, uh, get some markers that don't... See what you need is a dry marker. A dry marker just wipes off with an eraser. Because these things just smear. Yeah, if you ever take and put, accidentally grab a permanent marker and you white, put it on a whiteboard, the only thing that'll take a permanent marker is a dry, a dry marker. You immediately use that to erase the permanent marker and it'll come off. It's the only, you know, it's because of the chemical that they put inside of it. And these are a little bit better, yeah. That's, that's a real coarse paper there. Yeah, that'll work better. Yeah, this, this stuff here works better because they're softer. That's a real coarse paper. There. All right, now this here is a personal injury lawyer's writing. In, let me get my glasses. The... Uh, we're not going to use any names here because uh, to protect the innocent. <laughs> but this was a this case has been going on for three years. The lawyer in this case 
is becoming frustrated because he can't get the insurance company to settle with him. Now, when, when, you, do, when a, you write a legal contract, there's a law that says you cannot sign a blank sheet of paper, and a paper must have two legal sentences on it. As you can see, there's only part of a sentence that was brought over from the backside of this one. So this is not a legal sentence, nor is, is the autographs legal because they're both initials. You have to actually autograph something, not simulate it. And then the claim section is put into a box because Federal Reserve notes or uh, non-conclusive contract uh, values are not legal. So therefore they box it, and anything in a box is an enclosed area and can't be considered. So therefore, your, all of your IRS claims that they send you here in Australia, or the same as in the United States, are all boxed, written in adverb, verb, double space, and italicized. So they're using four conditions of fraud to remove it and create the illusion. We then take, how do you fight your case? How do you get a settlement from an insurance company? Well, the, this insurance issue here is the same as my mom and dad. They were involved in a car accident. They wanted to give my mom and dad $2,000 because and they were senior citizens and they both had back injuries as a result of this car accident. This is an injury case also. It's almost parallel to all the experience I had in my dad's case. So, and my dad was, the, the insurance company sends out a 350 questions for interrogatories that they want him to answer, giving him all his personal history of his life going back to when he graduated from high school and he's 72 years old. And he's going, this is, this is ridiculous and they want this before they're gonna pay me. And I'm going, don't worry about it, Dad. I'll take care of it. So I went through and it says, adverb verb. Says nothing, doesn't, has no condition. And I went through all 350 questions. It says, this doesn't pertain to the car accident. Send it back to the insurance company saying, you can't read and write, your paperwork is all fraudulently conveyed, your questions are nonsense and have nothing to do with a car accident. Chuck it. And he did. So then the lawyer that they had would not take their phone call. So I called him up and I says, I've corrected, I've syntaxed the work that you've done for the insurance company. And by syntaxing the language on the page, you have my parents paid you money and hired you because you have risk management insurance to guarantee that if there's any physical damage in the contracting of your conduct, that the insurance company will, will pay the damages, better known as malpractice. So I said to the lawyer, the language that you are using is fraudulently conveyed, and now you're talking about money. So this is bank fraud. And the insurance company's lawyers are also fraudulently conveying their language back to you. And they are submitting a paycheck to their insurance company while they are fraudulently conveying language to keep this thing floating in the air and never coming to a conclusion. Well, at the same time that they are fraudulently conveying language and sending in a paycheck, the paycheck is reducing the assets of the corporation, which is the insurance company, which is traded on the New York Stock Exchange, which means they've extorted money from a corporation, which is now stealing money from the shareholders and the Securities and Exchange Commission now has to come in and say, why are you paying employees to commit a criminal act under Title 18, Section 1001, and a Title 15, Chapter 2B, Section 78 FF, $25 million fine penalty and 30 years in prison while extorting money from a shareholder on his Securities and Exchange Commission. We only want $50,000. The penalty for fraudulently conveying language and extorting money from the Securities and Exchange is $25 million. And I've got a signed confession here. Will we, can we settle this now, quietly? And 48 hours later, we get a check in the mail for $2,500. And I'm going, yeah, right, okay, we need it. I says, Dad, Mom, I says, we need $385,000 for the aggravation and all the BS that these people have cost you. So we submitted a complaint of $385,000 to the insurance company. 
They immediately, all insurance companies worldwide, must take and put 10% of the initial claim in an escrow account which they cannot touch. So that's $38,500. Plus they have to take care of all the car expenses to rebuild the car and all the hospital medical expenses which came to about another 30 some thousand dollars. But the, the compensation for personal injury was $38,500. I says that is all you're going to get unless you want to spend three to five years in a court, get to a jury, and it'll be a crapshoot. You might win, but you're, there's a good chance you might not. There's an 80, 80, 20 chance on that. I says, so, I says, uh, by filing this claim and then showing them that the Securities and Exchange Commission is going to do an investigation on the lawyers from the insurance company as well as the individual who filed the claim with their lawyers where they acted together in a joint conspiracy to deny both the client and pay the insurance claim. And now we have a conspiracy, which is a 10-year prison sentence, to extort money, which is bank fraud and securities and exchange fraud. So now we got a whole stack and everything on the back of my business card also applies. So all of these things are now set on the table and we go and we meet with their, I call his, my mom and dad's lawyer up and I says, uh, all these things are going to happen and I hang up the